Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead. It's almost 1.15. We'll go ahead and uh, get started with our meeting today. On, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the fourth meeting of the ETSU Board of Trustees. Uh, before we move into the formal agenda, there are several items that I would like to spotlight and review for you. The first one is our enrollment. I'd like to commend the staff for their work to realize significant increases in the size of our freshman class for the 2017-18 academic year. This fall, 2050 freshmen began their educational journey at ETSU, which represents an increase of 10% over the past year. The class is well prepared academically with an average high school GPA of 3.5. I encourage the staff to continue to work the plan that was presented to the trustees during the September meeting. Remember our strategic enrollment plan and the goal of 18,000 students is important to the board. And we commend the staff again for their work to realize that goal. Secondly, student success. As Dr. Nolan noted in his State of the University address, the fall to fall retention rate for this year is 75.9%, which represents the highest retention rate in the history of the university. Additionally, this measure of student success has increased 10% since 2012-13 academic year. The board recognizes that no single initiative or individual is responsible for this outcome. It has been a collective campus endeavor. From the care that our grounds and custodial services staff place into our facilities, to the work of faculty, advisors, financial aid counselors, and other support personnel, the entire institution, including your board of trustees, is committed to st student success. On behalf of the trustees, I extend our congratulations to the campus on this accomplishment. However, I urge you to keep pushing because we expect to see similar results this next fall. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, merger. Since our September meeting, there has been considerable action on behalf of staff as well as trustees to ensure the realization of the Misha and Wilmot merger. The recognition by the state of Tennessee of the importance of the merger was a critical piece in realizing the long-term objectives. One of the byproducts of this merger will be the investment in medical residencies, research, continued uh, research in population health. It is critical that the university review its existing structure, staffing, and operations so that it is properly positioned to maximize the opportunities presented by that upcoming merger. On behalf of the trustees, I would like to charge Dr. Nolan to present the board at our next meeting a report on staffing, structure, and operations as well as any recommendations regarding changes that may need to be made to the aforementioned areas to ensure success in the post-merger environment. Four, athletics. Earlier today, in the Academic Affairs Committee, we heard the report from Scott Carter, the university's athletic director, regarding issues and opportunities impacting the athletic department. 
upon reflection of Scott's comments, I recognize the need for ETSU to review its Title IX as well as to begin preparations for the addition of new women's athletic programs. I would like to charge Dr. Nolan to work with Scott Carter and his staff to review the athletic department's strategic plan and outline steps to ensure that ETSU remain compliant with Title IX. I would like for Dr. Nolan to provide a formal report to the trustees at our 2008 summer quarterly board meeting regarding recommendations that emerge from this athletic review. Five board activities. As I referred to earlier, this marks the fourth meeting of the Board of Trustees. While I'm comfortable with the work that we have done to date, I recognize, as does the rest of the board, that there is much that remains to do. I welcome the comment and input from my fellow trustees regarding opportunities for improvement and in, in our meetings, schedules, operation, and communications. I encourage you to call and share your ideas as well. I look forward to working with you as we guide the university toward the realization of its strategic planning objectives. I would now turn to uh, the items on our agenda and ask Dr. Linville to call the roll. Dr. Alsa. Present. Ms. Ayers. Mr. DiCarlo. Present. Mr. Farner. Present. Mr. Golden. Present. Ms. Grisham. Present. Dr. Latimer. Present. Mr. Powell. Present. Mr. Ramsey. Present. Chairman Nicewanger. Present. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you. First item of business today will be the approval of our September 8th minutes. Do I have, uh, those are found uh, below tab one. I'd like a motion please for approval. So moved. Okay. Do I have a second? Any further discussion? All in favor of accepting the minutes as written, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. No further questions, Dr. Linville. Oh, well, we've done that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do it again. Um, uh, for consent agenda, are there any items uh, from the trustees on the consent agenda that members would like to pull for full board consideration? Yes, uh, Chairman, last one, I would like to pull item F from the consent agenda for further discussion. Okay. Any others? Okay. We'll go into discussion at this time. On uh, that. You, you can take a, a motion uh, to accept the rest of the consent agenda, and then we can dispense with item F. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so moved. Second. Second. In favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So item F is the academic calendars for 18, 19, and 1920. Uh, yes, I'm not, unfortunately, serving on the um, Finance Administration Committee. I was not able to participate in discussion for the, um, in the Student Affairs Committee earlier when this, was, um, when this was discussed previously. I'm not directly opposed to any of the changes within the calendar. However, um, Trustee Elsop and myself have the opportunity being on campus. We hear things and, you know, discussions and people make remarks and comments and that sort of thing. And over the past few weeks, um, several faculty and staff and students have shown some concerns with specifically um, regarding the calendar around the fall break decision. And I think particularly not the length of fall break or anything in regards to that. But I have heard some um, concerns that the month of November, as it currently is and has been in the past, is one of the most um, strenuous months for a lot of professors 
that is the month right before finals take place. They're trying to wrap up, catch up from any classes they've missed, students who've missed, that sort of thing. It's an extremely busy portion of the school year. And at the, with, this propo with the proposed changes as they are in this document, there's a three-week period within November where you experience six days of in-class, actual academic time that would be out of class. So you would have fall break for two days um, for this upcoming year, be November 1st and 2nd. You'd have a few days off, you're then off for Veterans Day, then you're back for a week, and then you're off for Thanksgiving break. And several faculty members and staff members have um, voiced some concerns regarding that. Um, and I just was hoping to maybe have a little further discussion around that. I did have the opportunity to um, speak with Dr. Nolan previous to this meeting um, and try to get a little context around the process by which the decision was made. So I'd love to invite Dr. Nolan if you'd like to share that a little bit more and maybe facilitate the discussion. As I mentioned, I'm not directly opposed to the changes, but I do think it's worth noting some people have voiced some concerns. So. Okay. Mr. Chair, members of the board, context on this item. Uh, as we were moving through a reflection of the academic calendar, uh, put together a committee to review the calendar and how the calendar aligns with uh, the needs of East Tennessee State University. Uh, the calendars that we have operated under uh, to this date have been developed by the Board of Trustees, I mean by the Board of Regents, and in many respects they were geared towards the needs of community colleges across the state. So this was the first opportunity in the history of our university to really put together a calendar that aligned with the needs of our institution rather than the needs of others. The recommendations that are before you came from that committee. These recommendations were shared with the Faculty Senate Executive Committee. They were shared with the Staff Senate Executive Committee. They were also shared with the Executive Committee of the Student Government Association. And none of those sessions were concerns raised about the calendar. And in fact, I met with both faculty and staff executive committees again yesterday. Uh, the chair of the staff senate is here. The president of the faculty senate is here. Uh, so if there are questions, would look to uh, Dr. Epps, Ms. Murphy, as well as Dr. Alsop. Um, but these are the only, this is the only question that has been raised to me about the calendar and the process has been inclusive um, and I have not received any concerns to date around the breaks and the way the breaks are formulated. Out of curiosity, if there, um, how does this calendar compare to the other LGIs that have been proposed for, or are you aware? I, I've not had the chance to review their calendars. Um, I did cross-reference for several members of the board how this calendar compares to calendars for other institutions. Um, it's relatively consistent. Uh, we did move spring break back a couple of weeks. Uh, I had re received concerns that spring break always was very early in the year. Um, but I recognize your question is around fall break. Um, Trustee Farner, I, I do not know off the top of my head how our freight fall break compares to others, but I know that there was a committee that reviewed this for several months. And I know that the faculty senate and the staff senate had reviewed this, uh, neither of whom addressed a concern. Any further discussion on, on this item? Mr. Chairman, we need a vote. Because it came from committee, there's no need for a motion. Right. Okay. All those in favor of item F as written, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Thank you, and thanks for your comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, item five, our report on finance from the Finance and Administration Committee, Steve DiCarlo. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, this morning we had our committee meeting, and if I could, I'd like to take you through some of the points. So the committee approved the October budget revision as presented, uh, keyword being the revision to reflect uh, the new uh, increased enrollment numbers. It will require a vote of the full board, and Dr. King will have a report on that later in the agenda. Uh, I also want to uh, stop a second and thank the staff and Dr. King for their hard work. We, they put up with a lot of questions uh, that I know sometimes even I as an accountant get confused, uh, but the staff does a great job of keeping us informed, and Dr. King does a great job of, of presenting to us. Uh, 
Also in the committee, we uh, were presented five policies as part of a continued review and of approval of finance and administrative policies. The policies reduce financial and organizational risk by establishing adequate internal controls for compliance with laws, regulations, and accepted business practices. The policies we reviewed were delegation of authority, signature authorization, disposal of surplus, personal property, equipment, movable property, inventory control, something that I studied all last night, <laughs> membership and subscriptions, <laughs> and of course the all important alcohol policy. Uh, all were accepted and noted. The committee approved the reduction, keyword being reduction, in the College of Medis Medicine fees for the debt and operations of the Student Center. The total fee was reduced from $650 to $550, I believe, that begins July 1 of 2018. The debt service portion was reduced by $140 based on debt amortization schedules. The operations portion was increased by $40 based on expense history. We reviewed the unaudited financial statements as they were presented. The audited audit is not yet complete and the audit report will not be released until sometime in the spring. We also reviewed the composite financial index from these unaudited statements all ratios are trending positively we focused on increasing reserves and learned a great deal about primary reserves and validity ratios increasing the reserves is part of the institutional strategic plan and we did go into that in quite a bit of detail the university is also preparing to implement a new budget model that is a more decentralized approach to budget and management. Dr. King took us through that process as its beginning, and the new model will be implemented this year. We reviewed the quarterly report of expenditures greater than $250,000, and all purchases were routine. And the last point is we got a brief update, uh, and I mean brief, update on the campus construction after last quarter receiving an in-depth review. Uh, I didn't get the name of the building, but everybody seemed to be excited that there's a potential opportunity that TIAC will put us in their top 10. And uh, I think as he explained it, it was the first time he'd heard the term 84 million and East Tennessee State University ever in the same sentence. Uh, am I allowed to talk about that? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to wait until the next donation to start. <laughs> right. uh, so with that, uh, I conclude our report. Thank you, Steve. Next item is a report from our Academic and Student Affairs Chairman, Dr. Linda Latimer. Academic and student. I'm going to let you know on the line now. It's Miss Ayers on the phone. I thought it was a big Oh my gosh. And was it Jan? Do we need to add her to our roll call? We'll be fine when we get there. Okay. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> on top of the consent agenda, um, information that we're going to go through again. We also had several information items, which included Dr. Hoff reviewing the ETSU performance within the THEC outcomes-based funding formula, which we had an interesting discussion about the Markov change. We will continue this afternoon. Um, our new athletics director, Mr. Scott Carter, gave a great presentation of the athletics initiative and success metrics. Scott Jeffers, the director of the Rhone Scholars Leadership Program, gave a presentation Dr. Bach gave a THEC program productivity report, but the majority of our time was spent on the consent agenda items, which I think we'll go into detail here in a few moments. So that concludes my report. Okay. Thank you, Linda. 
Uh, item seven, report from uh, chairman of our audit committee, David Gold. It just shows it's tough to follow uh, Chairman Latimer. That was a good, concise report, so I'm going to do my best. Um, uh, first, let me commend uh, Beck, uh, Rebecca Lewis and her team. Once again, a very busy quarter, uh, doing a lot of great work. In the audit committee, we uh, covered several of uh, the audits that she had finished, as well as uh, a couple of investigations. Uh, for this uh, meeting, it serves us to highlight the investigations. These are what I would call a little bit of a knock-on effect from the previous investigations around the ten men's tennis program. Uh, unlike the previous ones, which involved uh, expenses submitted for services that had not been rendered, these were expenses submitted for services that had been rendered. However, the expense submittal process that was followed was not consistent with university policy. In one instance, um, invoices were submitted, uh, making it appear that uh, an outside vendor had performed services when the services, and these services relate to restringing rackets, um, when in fact one of the uh, coaches had performed that service. But it's again important to note the services were actually rendered. Uh, we also uh, looked at the completed audit heat map. It's a wonderful frame that uh, Ms. Lewis has prepared to help us as a committee understand the relative significance of the audits performed. We looked and reviewed the recommendation log, which is a compilation of the mitigating steps that the auditees have committed to perform to close out action items. Happy to report everything was green except for one yellow, and uh, that yellow was discussed, and we were assured it would be green next time. Um, uh, Ms. Lewis then talked about the Quality Assurance and Improvement Program and the Institute of Internal Auditors um, uh, guidance. And according to state law, every five years, an internal audit program at the university level has to go through quality assurance, quality review of the actual audit program. These are the auditors getting audited to make sure their audit process is consistent with IIA protocols. Um, Ms. Lewis indicated they'd be going through that the first half of next year. It's a wonderful exercise when the auditors get audited. Um, with no other business, we then went into executive session and the discussion included uh, a good discussion around risk assessment and enterprise risk management. Mr. Chair, that's my report. Thank you, David. This time, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. King, our Acting Chief Financial Officer, to pre present an, an overview of the amendments. Good afternoon. I had the pleasure of reviewing uh, this same set of slides with the Finance Committee. So I look forward to taking you through this process as well today. Um, we submit uh, two major budgets to through this board to the Tennessee Board of Regents for debt coverage approval and then on to THEC and through THEC to the state. So it's a lengthy process and this is our October revisions. We presented the July budget to you last spring which you approved and now we've got some more experience with what's going to happen this year so we do an October revision and we'll submit it to the state. But today we're going to ask for your approval on these revisions. Um, as has been described um, already today, we have good news this fall in that our enrollment was up. Not only was it up, it was better than our budget because we had actually budgeted for enrollment to be down. So that was great news, and with that, we're making an adjustment to our tuition and fees of almost $4 million, $4 million increase. Um, the university is receiving additional money through the Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System, so we're taking that state appropriation and increasing that in the budget. Um, the university school has expanded their program and added an entire class into their school and with that we're going to receive some additional revenue from Washington County. Um, during the fiscal year end we identified some issues with 
our revenue. It's correct in the 630 financial statements, but since the budget was prepared before the 630 financial statements were prepared, we needed to adjust this category sales and services other in our budget. So we're increasing it. And then, as I said, enrollment was up, housing was at near capacity, and we've had more enrollments in our food service meal plans. So our auxiliary revenue is going to be up for the year. So that is all reflected in this ad additions to our um, revenue budget. So the additions are slightly more than $7 million. I have this slide in here to explain to you why my revenue is going up $7 million and my expenditures are going up $15 million. Um, this is a little activity that we do in October. And if you looked at our July budgets, which you have in your materials from last spring, you'll see that our revenues and our expenditures are almost exactly matched. They're very, very close across all units at the university. But when we get to the fall, um, we have to do an adjustment for what we call carry forward funds. We have some fees that we collect from students that are not fully expended in the prior in the prior year. And with that, we carry these funds forward into the next year so that we can expend them for that same purpose. One in particular is our technology access fee. And um, we collect that fee over the year and student um, fees. And when we get to the year end, we look and see what we have not expended. It still needs to be expended for that purpose. It will be expended this year. So we carry those funds forward. In order to maintain budget control, we have to put these expenditures in our expenditure budget. But they're really being paid for out of our fund balance because that's where we park them at year end on our financial statements. So this is why every year when we get to October, you all are going to see that my revenue goes up a certain amount, but my expenditures will always go up by more because we're counting for those carry forward funds. So that's just kind of an explanation. Um, you'll see on the instruction line, we're showing that carry forward fees were almost $8 million that are going back into the instruction uh, function for the university. Um, the other item of note might be, uh, I think in particular, if you look at the student services line, you'll see that student services is going down by $3.1 million. That is because in this budget preparation process, we were told to move athletic scholarships from student services down to the scholarship and fellowship line. Um, we had done what we'd always been told to in the past, which was put it in student services. That's where it's always been. But this go round, they wanted us to move it down to scholarships and fellowships, so we did. So scholarships and fellowships went down by $3.1 million. But Scott, or student services went down. Scholarships and fellowships went up by $6.2 million, which includes that $3.1 million plus additional scholarship um, funds that we found that we needed for this year going forward. So we've adjusted that those two budget items. Institutional support um, went up by a little bit over a million dollars because of, again, carry forward fees. And that was the same um, thing that happened with academic support. It's primarily increasing with carry forward fees. So that is the, explains, I guess, I hope, the difference between the $7 million increase in revenue and the $15 million increase in um, expenditures. So if we move to the next slide, it shows where we're putting that money. This probably requires an explanation as well. So if you look in there, um, you'll see that we increased employee benefits. Again, the majority of that was driven by the uh, Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System increase that we, were, we received the state appropriation for. Um, but our operating expenses are the one that's significantly higher, an increase of $10 million. And that is where we're putting those, the majority of those carry-forward funds. 
what will happen is then uh, budget managers in every budget area across campus has access to that budget in operating expenses. And if they choose to, they can move some of that money to travel, or they could move some of that money to um, temporary support within their unit to hire temporary staff um, to assist uh, with whatever um, programs they have going forward this year. So we just basically park the money in operating expenses and then the budget managers will do budget adjustments throughout the year to move that money around where the need is within the unit. And when we get to our um, May time or April time period when we're preparing our actual budget um, for our May submittal, you'll actually see us true these numbers up. So these will get trued up at that point in time. So I thought it was real important to explain the difference between the revenue and expenditures before we ever got to this slide. This is basically just a summary of what we've already gone over. So revenue, we're uh, budgeting a $7.3 million increase. Um, we're expecting our uh, expenditures to be budgeted at 15.5 more in expenditures. I will explain that our debt service, we had bonds that were refunded um, earlier this fall. So some of our bond expense actually went down, but we also had two new facilities that were bonded this fall. That would be our football stadium and also our family medicine Kingsport facility that had waited on bond funding for two years. We have a $1 million dollar transfer and non-mandatory transfers that's an addition in the October revisions and that's where we're putting money back into our reserves and as I already said auxiliaries activity went up with food service and housing with that recognition of that additional revenue we've increased um, transfers from those operating dollars to our uh, renewal and replacement funds so that we can keep those facilities updated um, with those fundings. Uh, moving to the College of Medicine, their revenue is up just slightly based on fee increases. They are showing a decline in dollars that will be going to um, instruction. Um, most of these adjustments in the expenditure side are, if they're increases, they're related to carry forward funding. Um, the decrease in instruction uh, was due to the fact that we're down a few students in the College of Medicine this fall. Nothing to be concerned about, but it does reflect in the instruction number. Um, we also have on the non-mandatory transfers line, a transfer coming into the college of $2 million. This is a transfer in order to balance the budget. When we get to the springtime period, you're probably going to see the same dollar amount or more going back out of these <coughs> funds to R&R renewal and replacement funds for them to set aside for uh, future projects, um, construction projects and renovation projects. Family medicine is pretty straightforward. They are expecting um, some increase in clinic revenue, so that's the revenue side of that activity. And they basically allocated um, the expenditure side based on uh, history of, of those expenditures. So revenue and expenditures went up about the same amounts for family medicine budget. College of Pharmacy budget, we have a little reduction in revenue. This is due to a slight decline in um, student enrollment, nothing to be concerned about, but you have to realize when students are paying that dollar amount in tuition, it impacts the revenue. So that's what that, um, what that line is. And um, the rest of the expenditure adjustments are basically related to our carry forward funds. So revenue went down and expenditures went up for uh, College of Pharmacy. So I hope I've explained um, thoroughly enough for you uh, how this works and, and about the carry forward funding, putting it in the budget, 
We do that as a method of controlling those expenditures, but for the carry forward funds, they are part of our fund balance. That's why our revenues and expenditure increases are not going to match in October. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. King. Thank you very much. David, at this time, I'd ask for a roll call vote since Ms. Ayers has joined us. Uh, on Thank the you, call. Mr. Chairman. And, and before I call the roll, I just want to make sure that uh, Trustee Ayers can hear us well. Can you hear us well? I can. Okay. I can. Thank you very much. And all the other trustees can hear Ms. Ayers. Um, and, and are you by yourself, Ms. Ayers, or is anyone in the room with you? I'm by myself. Thank you. And then just from a technical perspective, if uh, you're not talking and you keep it on mute, that'll keep us from having feedback here so that you can hear, hear well. So um, to call the roll. Yes. Uh, and I, bet, I, bet I will. I've been on mute until right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so the roll call vote for uh, the October budget revision. Uh, Dr. Alsop? Yes. Ms. Ayers? Yes. Mr. DiCarlo? Yes. Mr. Golden? Yes. Ms. Grisham? Yes. Dr. Latimer? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Ramsey? Yes. Chairman Neiswanger? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Next on the agenda, item 9, Wilmot Memorandum of Understanding. I'd like to turn to Dr. Bishop. I know people who would like for me to come with a mute button periodically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chairman Neiswanger, distinguished Board of Trustees, uh, I'm pleased to be back before you this afternoon to talk about the memorandum uh, of understanding with Wellmont Health System. Uh, you might recall that in June, uh, I came before you to talk about the MOU that we were developing with Mountain States Health Alliance. Uh, and at that time, I said as soon as that um, MOU was complete, we would begin conversations with Wellman Health System to establish a similar MOU with them. Um, and we did. And so that's why we're bringing it before you today. Uh, just in case uh, you wonder who's in the academic health sciences, I wanted to show you our pictures one more time. Those are our five colleges. We affiliate with these health systems, Frontier Health, uh, Mountain Health VA uh, Healthcare System, Mountain States Health Alliance, and Wellmont Health System. With the Wellmont Health System, we do over $8 million in contracts, in resident salaries, and in services. Uh, this was our uh, FY16 total. And you can see that uh, our students are significantly involved in training experiences within their facilities. Uh, all of our colleges place students in Wellmont facilities uh, in both uh, Kingsport and in Bristol uh, and in Greenville. And I wanted to give you a little more detail on our uh, College of Medicine activities with the Wellmont system, because we do some things with them that are a little different than those things we do with Mountain States uh, in relationship to the original uh, MOUs that we had established with them when the College of Medicine uh, came into being in 1970s. Uh, our residency program in family medicine was established uh, prior to the establishment of the College of Medicine, and I think we've talked about that before. But our residencies that we have with the Wellmont system are family medicine, internal medicine. Uh, we do a pulmonary and critical care fellowship with them, and we also have surgery. Uh, our surgery residents at Holston Valley Hospital and Medical Center uh, staff their level one trauma center, which has been very important to the education of our medical students and residents. Uh, they rotate with the surgical associates of Kingsport, uh, and they provide a surgical consultation to all departments in the hospital there and provide ICU coverage. Uh, at Bristol, uh, they rotate with Bristol Surgical Associates and the Wilmot Health System uh, cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, they provide surgical consults in all departments, uh, and they also provide ICU coverage. Uh, our Family Medicine Center in Kingsport and Bristol have been uh, valuable parts of those communities. Uh, they have rotations across the emergency department, OBGYN, PEDS, trauma and surgery, and ICU. Uh, the residents are in-house 24-7 in Bristol uh, and Kingsport. I'm sorry, in Kingsport, not in Bristol. But they're in the house 24-7, so that means they're available for uh, codes. Uh, they are available for backup uh, for OBGYN for deliveries, uh, and they take unattached uh, community doc calls. 
So they have really ingratiated themselves to the physicians in that community. Their team-based community care has been uh, very significant. Uh, the transitions of care uh, clinics that they hold and the uh, joint projects between our College of Pharmacy and Family Medicine have gotten significant recognition nationally and internationally. Uh, and also, uh, our Family Medicine Centers have achieved the highest level of uh, patient-centered medical home, level three. Uh, and in um, internal medicine in Kingsport, also they provide significant continuity between inpatient, ambulatory care, team-based care within our professional teams. The residents serve on the, uh, a number of the committees and boards within the hospital, uh, and they provide coverage and service in the ER, in IUC, in neuro, and in palliative care. Uh, and at Bristol, our uh, residents and fellows staff the ICU as part of a multidisciplinary health team there. Uh, our fellows perform pulmonary consultation, and they manage long-term ventilation care and rehabilitative medicine. So I think you get an idea of how important it is for us to have an MOU um, with the Will My Health System. So why is this important? Well, as your uh, board uh, memo states, uh, it affirms our mutual commitment to providing health care and uh, professional education with the Wellmont Health System. It affirms our commitment between the two institutions. We have developed significantly over the 60 years that we have partnered with Wellmont Health System. Uh, it provides an infrastructure for communication, which has been very important for us. Uh, and it acknowledges the relationship that we have for providing comprehensive care to the region. So why a MOU with Walmart Health System now when the health system merger is on the horizon? I think that may be a question some of you are asking yourselves. Well, uh, this was initiated prior to the approval of the COPA and the cooperative agreement. Uh, we said that when we uh, established the MOU with Mountain States, we would also move forward to do one with Wellmont. We met with the Wellmont executives uh, in June, uh, soon after the meeting with you all, and got the approval of the MSHA MOU. And we talked about the process. Uh, and we brought together uh, all of the deans of the Academic Health Center and a number of the members of the leadership team of the Wellmont Health System. And we found that in that discussion, there was a lot of um, things that each of us didn't know about the other. And so as we began to talk, uh, we realized that we had grown and we had outgrown some of the relationships that we've had over the years. And it was agreed that it would be appropriate for us to have the conversations that we needed to have to talk about that relationship between our uh, institution and their health system so that when the ballot merger occurred and we were moving forward with a ballot MOU, uh, that Wilmot would have had the same discussions with us that Mountain States had had. And that was a very profitable thing for us to do. So uh, we've, we've developed an MOU is that you've had an opportunity to, to review, which is similar to the one with Mountain States Health Alliance. Uh, it is a, more focused on communication and coordination and less focused on governance than the one that we have with Mountain States Health Alliance. But it does have the provision for a coordinating council that includes a representative from this board along with a representative from the Wellmont Health System Board. The coordinating council is larger, uh, but it takes the place of the clinical coordinating council because we have somewhat of a committee of the whole of all the people involved in making decisions about clinical activities involved in the original coordinating council. Uh, we believe that this puts us in the best position uh, to move forward with um, both systems. Uh, should something occur and the merger not happen, uh, then we have our relationships straight and clear uh, and on paper with the two systems. If, when the merger does occur, and notice I said when the merger does occur, then we're in the best position because we've had these conversations now to move forward with the Ballard MOU. Uh, and, it, and I would uh, anticipate in a few months I'll be back before this board with that MOU, and it will look much more like the original MOU with Mountain States that was much more governance focused. Okay. I'm open for questions. Questions? Everyone clear? 
We'll now have a roll call vote on the uh, MOU with Dr. Also. I vote yes. Ms. Ayers? Yes. Mr. DiCarlo? Yes. Mr. Golden? Yes. Ms. Grisham? Yes. <coughs> Vladimir? Yes. Mr. Powell? Yes. Mr. Ramsey? Yes. Chairman Nicewanger? Yes. Carries. Okay. Item 10, legislative agenda. I'd, let, I'd like to ask uh, Bridget Baird, our Associate Vice President for Community and Government Relations, to report, please. Good afternoon. Chairman Nicewanger, distinguished members of the board, and distinguished members of the audience. Um, before I get into uh, explaining a little bit about our department, I wanted to let you know a little bit about my background. I know many of you, but some of you I don't know as well. So I wanted to let you know I grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, I began my professional career at Duke Power, which became Duke Energy in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then came back to Tennessee and worked uh, for the electric utility TVA, which was a public utility. So I saw quite a difference between a private utility and a public utility. It was very interesting and a very learning experience. I began my public service career back in 1997, uh, working for Congressman Bill Jenkins. And I still remember to this day, Congressman Jenkins looked at me and he said, Bridget, I want you to be on my staff. And I said, but sir, I know nothing about politics. He said, Bridget, I'll teach you everything you need to know. <laughs> Famous last words. Uh, and I learned from one of the best there. I also worked for Senator Bob Corker. Uh, I worked in his first term and worked part of his second term. Again, another one of the best. So it's been four and a half years since I've been at ETSU, and my, how time does fly. And I'm working for another one of the best. It's an honor to work for ETSU and to work for Dr. Nolan. He wanted someone to come in and look at the big picture for government relations, not just one college, not just one area, but to look at the big picture. So that was my task. I came in and I act as the liaison between elected officials in the local, state, and federal. And sometimes that's a big deal. Um, I really am encouraging them to engage at the university, to educate them on what's going on. And I forgot to flip my, spot, my slide. Uh, to talk about what our student, students, our staff, and our faculty are doing here, which is really exciting, and get them engaged. I know in the summers right before recess, I have calls from their staffers to come down and learn about the university. Many of them don't know about ETSU. Some of them want to learn about the specific things we are doing. For instance, uh, members of the HELP Committee, uh, came, staffers came down to learn about the opioid crisis and the Center for Prescription Drug Abuse. Again, um, at the federal level, I have been able to go to D.C. once or twice a year to meet with the delegation and meet with their staffs to tell them about things that we're doing here. This summer, I took um, uh, information about the opioid crisis and the Center for Prescription Drug Abuse. Um, that's an area I feel like we could do a lot more in, but we have been hesitant because we no longer have earmarks at the federal level, and quite frankly, I don't have a large staff. So again, the whole idea is to engage with local, state, and federal uh, uh, elected officials. At the local level, we've been able to engage um, quite frequently. Uh, I'm on um, all three chamber, Tri-City Chambers, Government Relations Councils. I chair the Government Relations, Relations Committee at the Kingsport Chamber, and I'm on the Kingsport Chamber Board. Um, we've also established local leadership meetings. Dr. Nolan and I meet with the mayors, the county um, mayor, the city managers, the economic development folks, uh, to talk about some of the things that we can help them with and they can help us with. And one of the items that came out of uh, these meetings and the beginnings of discussions about were the partnership between Johnson City and ETSU and the use of Freedom Hall. And now we have a beautiful venue where we watch basketball and that was a result of, of beginning conversations. We do the same thing in Kingsport and Bristol. 
In Kingsport, we were able to talk about moving the ETSU downtown offices to and students to the academic village in the higher ed center. We did that. We also were able to work with Wilmot and the College of Nursing to establish uh, more nurses for, for Holston Valley, which they felt like they had a nursing shortage. So again, these are some of the things that have come out of those local informal meetings with those elected officials. Um, we also established a government relations council. And I'm really excited and proud of this. Um, it's made up of members, uh, business leaders in the community in the region, uh, former elected officials, um, former legislators, uh, alumni. And what they're able to do is learn more about what's going on at ETSU, engage with our legislators, and help advocate for the university. Uh, we have a former congressman on that team. We have two former mayors. We have a publisher of a newspaper. We have really strong um, business leaders, and we also have uh, strong alumni. So this has been a really, really good thing, I think, for the university. Um, in, at the state level, I am during session, uh, which is quite a bit of the time, in Nashville. And uh, I'm interfacing with legislators. I am uh, monitoring legislation that's going on. I'm uh, listening in at hearings. I am attending committee meetings. I'm working with state agencies. So I'm down there, again, quite a bit during session. You'll notice in the left-hand picture, uh, since I've been here, we started a legislative luncheon. We invited our, our delegation. We also invited members of the General Assembly that attended ETSU or that graduated from ETSU. We invited the governor, uh, the two speakers, and the constitutional officers. This past year, as you'll see in the picture, we had Governor Haslam stop by and say a few words. We had both speakers in attendance, Lieutenant Governor McNally and Speaker Harwell and many of the constitutional officers. We also encourage students to interact with our legislators. We've had um, students in the College of Medicine. We've had Roan Scholars. You've heard about them as well. And we've had this past year pictured five of our interns who were doing legislative uh, internships with the General Assembly. They were either working for the Senate or the House or in the clerk's office. And I'm happy to say that two of those uh, interns graduated from ETSU, they were seniors, and they currently are working in House members' offices in Nashville. <clears throat> so I'd like to review the 2017 uh, legislative agenda for the university. We appreciated and fully supported the funding outcomes formula and salary enhancements. We supported all of the deferred funding for deferred maintenance projects. We supported uh, funding for our capital projects, primarily the renovation for Lamb Hall. We supported the focus implementation and, of course, the confirmation of you all and the other uh, trustees for the six public institutions for their boards. And there were major policy changes that the legislature enacted impacting access, veterans, the Strong Act, which allows uh, National Guardsmen to come back to school to get their education. The Reconnect Act, which allows uh, older students to come back and get their certificate or their associate's degree or degree. And also, the legislature uh, put new policies uh, in line for free speech. And I'm happy to say that we were really in compliance with free speech. We, we've done a great job there and have always complied with the law. So we, uh, again, are allowing the university to uh, be the marketplace for ideas and to uh, protect those rights of the faculty, staff, and students in res with respect to free speech. We also, this session, hosted the House uh, drug Opioid Task Force. Speaker Harwell came with members of her task force. We held a forum on campus. We invited members of the community, elected officials, uh, members of the medical field, um, Dr. Pack with the college, with the um, Center for Pre Prescription Drug Abuse, 
led the discussion. Uh, Alan Levine from Mountain States gave a personal testimony there at that event, and the task force was very appreciative. It was the first meeting outside of Nashville that they uh, had, had held. So we were a little disappointed. We had put $500,000 in the budget for a budget amendment. It stayed in till the very end, and it was on next to the last day, and it got cut. So uh, we hope that with the recommendations from the task force that in 2018 we might secure dollars for funding for that Center of Prescription Drug Abuse. They're doing a fabulous job. Um, just about three weeks ago, we had a legislative luncheon at the Gray Fossil site. Uh, we invited the Tennessee our, our Northeast Tennessee delegation, members of the advisory team, and um, leadership at ETSU. You can see Dr. Nolan there. He's presenting some charts uh, to the group. We talked about our legislative agenda. One of the reasons we held the meeting at the Gray Fossil site was to show the strong collaborative effort between the Fossil site, the Center for uh, Paleontology, and hands-on museum. This is really turning to be turning out to be a great partnership. We're excited about it. We wanted the legislators to be able to tour the facility and also see the latest exhibit. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it, which is the Mastodon exhibit. So I'd like to uh, present the uh, 2018 legislative agenda that Dr. Nolan presented at that meeting. We support and appreciate funding for outcomes for formula for this year again. We support scholarships for the Gatton School of Pharmacy. Dr. Bird presented last board meeting and you unanimously approved her recommendation. What this does is level the playing field for Tennessee taxpayers and closes the tuition gap between the two state public colleges of pharmacy. Um, Chairman Nicewanger alluded to this, or it was maybe uh, Member DiCarlo, about the um, capital project for the Humanities to building. building. We're excited about that. That's approximately $76 million. Uh, we support, again, efforts uh, that the Center for Drug Abuse uh, would help with the opioid uh, epidemic. We support deferred maintenance projects, that would be HVAC systems, roofing, uh, maintenance repairs, water lines, um, code deficiencies. And if there are dollars in the budget again for campus safety, we would like to have that money as well to do continue to replace locks, doors, and to make our campus more safe. And then you heard also about the merger uh, with Mountain States and Wellmont. We would appreciate funding there. Uh, based on that merger uh, for university research dollars. So in closing, uh, I think we have a fabulous opportunity to work together with you, the board, to work together with our students, faculty, and staff, to work with our elected officials, our community leaders, our advisory council, to make this a, a great place and a quality region to live now and beyond. So I thank you for your time. It's been a privilege to speak to you, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Mr. Chair, if I could, just a little bit of context around this slide. Uh, earlier this week, I had the opportunity pr to present uh, the budget on behalf of uh, the independent institutions to Governor Haslam. So Jody Pietro presented the budget on behalf of the University of Tennessee system. Floor Tidings, the Chancellor of the Board of Regents, presented the budget on behalf of TBR. Mike Krauss framed everything within a policy perspective. And then I presented on behalf of the six institutions that formerly were under the umbrella of the Board of Regents. Uh, within that conversation, I am hopeful that there will be significant support for outcomes. Uh, essentially, about a 5% increase in outcomes funding is what THEC We'll recommend next week, which hopefully will go into Governor Haslam's budget. Uh, at that commission meeting next week, we will present to THEC the proposal around scholarships that you all discussed at the last meeting. Um, there was reference, uh, Trustee DiCarlo talked about the Humanities Building. Um, this is a project that in the former system uh, might have made its way onto a list. Um, 
by the time Nathan was president of the university, um, <laughs> because that's how long that process would take. Uh, for example, the Martin Center went on to the list uh, when I was a senior in high school, and we broke ground on the Martin Center several months ago. But within a new process in which the commission is independently scoring projects based upon their own merits, uh, we are very hopeful that that project will be in the top 10 capital projects for the year, which puts us in a position in which we'll either receive planning money or we may actually receive funding for the entirety of the building. That's something that will work its way through in the next couple of months. Um, and then on the final bullet, um, I'm very hopeful that there will be funding for um, pediatric subspecialists included in the governor's budget. Uh, there were conversations in the governor's budget hearing this week about the opportunity to fund pediatric subspecialists, right around $600,000 and change with $590,000 on a recurring basis, which would support four pediatric subspecialists at the Nice Walker Children's Hospital in conjunction with the College of Medicine. So this is very early in the game, looking to Dr. Bach, if this were a baseball analogy. We're in the second inning. There's a lot of game left to be played. Um, but we have the opportunity, and I'm very hopeful and confident about the opportunity, to realize almost every single thing on this list. Um, and if we were able to realize the humanities building as well as the pediatric subspecialists at the bottom, um, to say this would be transformative for the university is an understatement. Um, I, don't, I saw Jeremy in here earlier, uh, just a, a little bit of, of light note. Um, when Jeremy presented the uh, presentation to the Finance Committee at the last meeting on this building, there was a wonderful slide um, with pictures of hallways and restrooms. Um, Jeremy ended up presenting that slide with hallways and restrooms to THEC, and it was a pretty powerful presentation. So if this project is funded, I beg your permission to uh, name a portion of the restroom after Mr. Ross, uh, because I think it would only be fitting. Uh, Jeremy did a, 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 just an absolutely fantastic job in making the case, and um, his ability to make that case uh, pushed this project into the top 10, which I never in a million years thought would happen. I think that's an appropriate request about. I need a motion on that. <laughs> You can put a picture in a strategic I got, I got you. For President, you're missing fundraising opportunities. You have other stalls. <laughs> <laughs> I have a name, too. Uh, well, Thank we you. digress. Thank you, Bridget. Yes. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, uh, item 11, I'd like to ask Dr. Hoff, please, to review with us the enrollment projections in less than 20 minutes. <laughs> Since I went long this morning, I'll be sure to make it up this afternoon. <laughs> I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to present this. I know it's after lunch, it's the afternoon, and most people don't like to get mathy that time of day. So I'll try to keep the numbers light and keep you focused on the purpose of a projection. So um, I arrived at ETSU in August of 2013. And... Um, in September, Dr. Bach came to me and said, the president would like to project enrollment for next fall. And I said, how close do we have to get? And he said, how close do you think you can get? And I said, I don't know, probably within 80%. And he says, that sounds pretty good. And the next week, he comes back and he said, well, I talked to the president and he said, private school presidents know within 5% what their enrollment's going to be next fall. I said, so it's 5% now instead of 80 or 95% instead of 80%. He said, I think so. And so we set about looking for an enrollment projection that was a, a valid model. And uh, I'll talk to you today about how we went about identifying that, how we established validity, how we use the projection, and I'll also give you some highlights. Um, people don't think a lot about it, um, but, um, and I'm, I'm always reminded, and I, I know this isn't higher education, but I'm always reminded of a scene from Days of Thunder, which was a racing movie, right? Tom Cruise is trying to drive this car, and he, he keeps burning up the tires. And he finally tells the crew chief, he goes, I don't know how to tell you what's going wrong. And then they figure out a code, and they're able to all of a sudden start winning races. That's what enrollment projections are like. People running an institution might not be able to tell you why certain things are happening, but if we get relatively good at knowing when and how, and, and how they're going to happen, we can go about changing the direction. I think you've seen that at ETSU. 
So the background was um, what I described earlier, that we had to get within 5% in order for Dr. Nolan to feel like we had something we could use. Um, we also don't talk about this a lot, but it allows us to test recruitment and retention scenarios. So um, if somebody says, hey, I think this year we ought to do this with this scholarship, we can get some idea of how much impact we expect that scholarship to have upon the projection. Um, it also allows us to test some things in markets when it comes to recruitment. Um, every year we try to expand the projection in an area that it hasn't been before. So for the first couple of years, uh, I would project university level enrollment, then we moved down to the college, now we've moved down to the credit hour, and eventually, um, hopefully, we can get down to some market demographics that will allow us to have a, a little bit more precise control over uh, entering students, both freshmen and transfer. We also use them to set goals and we use them to inform the budget. So why, uh, these are the assumptions. I always forget these, but these are important because if I'm ever wrong, this is why my assumptions didn't work out. That's how assumptions work in a statistical analysis. So the biggest assumption is a consistent external environment. It also assumes that student behavior happens about the same way it does every year. There's a reason it happens about the same way it does every year. We have a lot of rules. Right? We're an institution with rules. People have to follow that pathway, and because of that, they're relatively predictable. Um, we also assume medicine and pharmacy enrollment is stable and it's recognized as a known quality quantity. When you see the numbers, we don't include medical residents. Uh, we just calculate that as a total at the end that we report. So um, why a Markov chain, I think, is important. Um, but first, we'll talk about... Uh, what it is. And really, um, if you saw it, it's almost like rain. You take uh, the current year's enrollment and you stretch it out across several columns in an Excel spreadsheet, and then down along the side, you have what the next class levels are for the following year, and you watch the students fall like rain. So you would expect that you start out with freshman retention, right? So they go from freshmen to sophomores. So when I calculate the freshmen for fall 16, there are no, none of those people are freshmen again in fall 17. Wrong. When I start out with freshmen, none of those people are seniors in fall 17. Mm, wrong. There are a lot of pathways, and uh, people can accumulate a lot of credit before they get here. The way that we process people, and because we use census dates to establish all this, that's when we start to get into why it's important to project enrollment. Because if we assume everybody just operated on the normal pattern and we had 100% graduation at four years, we wouldn't need an enrollment projection. We could just calculate about how many people were in the population and say that's how many people we're going to have next year. And obviously, that doesn't really work out. So why did we choose it? Um, there's a, a person I have to give credit for. Gary Donhart was uh, the director of institutional research for a long time at uh, the University of Memphis and a big participant in um, the, um, uh, the Tennessee Association of Institutional Researchers, which is where I learned about the Markov chain. And so um, the other thing is I tried a bunch of other stuff, and I couldn't get that close. I went back three years and I kept trying to get close and we just couldn't. I tried a time series decomposition, I tried a population analysis, I even got people that know math better than me and uh, statistical analysis better than me and software tools better than me to run ARIMA models in SAS. And all of them took an incredibly long time, they were very complicated to explain, and they still weren't as accurate as the Markov chain. Now will that be true next year? I don't know, we'll see. So how did we validate it? So Banner was implemented at ETSU in 2008. So what we did is we started with that as the time frame. Because what you don't want is a whole bunch of data system changes to start messing around with your student progression rates, which is sort of what happened before 2008. And then we, we basically went back and I calculated um, enrollment periods up through 2010. What did we find? Um, a 95% confidence interval it was at a 2% margin of error. 99 was a 2.4%. What that means from a statistical analysis perspective is 99% of the time, the number I tell you is going to be within 2.4%, unless we change or the external environment changes, right? Unless, remember those assumptions, the reasons why I'm not wrong, the environment was just different? Those are important, especially to me. So here it is. Now what I'll tell you is, um, you got to remember, I came here in August 2013. In August 2013, they asked me to project enrollment, and I did for 2014. We made that presentation on October 25th, 2013. 
So somebody who had come from a community college that had been here less than six months was suddenly telling everybody what was going to happen at ETSU next year. I wasn't invited to a lot of parties. And then we calculated the enrollment, and I was only off by four students. I got invited to no parties. Because people think you're weird when you can do stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily for me, uh, ETSU started to change, and I became less accurate in my projection. Because if I'd have done something like that three years in a row, you all would have called me a wizard and asked me to leave. But I do think it's important. The reason I classify that that way is because ETSU started to change. And you can't forget about that. So the headcount projection is 14,525. Um, I'll also take this, this opportunity to tell you that although this time was the, the biggest gap between projected enrollment and actual enrollment, because we did project it and because we use a Markov chain that looks at it by class level and because we use an induced course load matrix to get down to the college level, I can tell you something about why that happened. And that's important because it tells us that our scholarships worked and some other things. We'll also take this opportunity to tell you that we set the budget on a much lower number, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So the low end of the margin of error is 14,176, and the high end is 14,874. Both those numbers exclude medical residents, which will be around 250. The reason those numbers are important is because of what I talked about for the validation. 99% of the time, if we don't change and the environment doesn't change, enrollment is going to be somewhere between those two numbers. And granted, you might like it to be a little more specific, but if anybody could stand up here today and tell you exactly what your bank account is going to be next year within 2%, I think we'd all take it. And that's sort of what this is. Um, but lower enrollment is possible would mean a deviation in the norm, and what I mean is either from the internal or the external environment, the same thing for higher enrollment. Then we project credit and FTE enrollment, and we use an induced course load matrix for this. That's a fancy term for saying I create a chart that looks at the headcount college of a student and the credit hour college of a student. So I look at biology majors who take classes in public health and figure out what percent that happens. Remember I talked about those rules before? Those rules apply to programs, which is what allows an induced course load matrix to work. I know what courses they're supposed to be taking. If they are taking courses in the major, they tell me they're in, which isn't always true. Um, we find a lot of people all of a sudden switch their major the day before graduation because they've been taking classes in something else. But this is important because it makes it real for the colleges. We've talked a lot about a decentralized budgeting model. What do you need to be able to have an efficient decentralized budget model? You need to have good budget projections at the level you're going to decentralize to. We need to know how those numbers impact each other. And that's what an induced course load matrix allows you to do. It's still in development, but so far we've been able to become as accurate with FTE as we were with the headcount. So I want to talk a little bit about how we use these. The first year I was here, everybody just kind of was like, all right, Mike projected enrollment. And they were like, okay, that's fine, whatever. The second year, they were like, Mike really projected enrollment. And they're like, yep, whatever he said, that's what's going to happen next year. And then by the third year, they were like, wait a minute, we can do something about this. And so we started to have a lot of conversations with the deans, with the department chairs, and I started to get invited to a lot more meetings to talk about how this operates. And so that's really how we use it. We use it to determine staffing, we use it to set budgets, and we use it to drive actions on goals. We also use it to assess our effectiveness. If I expect from the model that our enrollment is going to be 97% from X, and it turns out that's not true, we have an assessment variable at that point. It allows us to be scientific in the way that we assess ourselves. It's not just, I put in all this work, it must be a good thing that we did that. That isn't cut it anymore, especially not with an outcome-based funding formula. So this, I'm not going to read this to you, but I bring it up because I like to rib Dr. Bach a little bit about it. Uh, disruptive initiatives were our big focus in the third year of the enrollment projection. And I, I like to point out that Dr. Bach and I came up with this definition. And I think if you read through it, it will look like a, an English professor and a statistician wrote it. Um, but what it really drove home was that for us to change enrollment, you had to do something where you had never done it before. Or you had to do something you do really well in a place you've never done it before. And you had to, to, to make sure that you didn't steal from the other college to make it happen. 
I, I think that's important to stress given where we're headed now. You, you, can't, you can't steal from the other side. We have to find a way to make this grow together. So were we disruptive? Yes. Yes, we were. What does disruption look like? Online growth. Online growth. If you look at the arc of ETSU's growth in online courses, it does not parallel nationally. It exceeds it a little bit. We've got some work to do in programs, and that's how we're going to be disruptive again, is we're going to grow programs, not just courses. Scholarship opportunities. I don't know of maybe other, one or two other institutions that are looking as seriously down to the level of scholarship opportunities that we are. From uh, the, the um, consent agenda that you all approved in the, the committee meeting this morning, we're talking about how it is we impact county level enrollment decisions based on competing on price. County level enrollment decisions based on how we compete on price. 10 years ago, nobody was talking about that. You just offer a scholarship, kids like getting money, they're gonna come. That's all you had to say. Athletics, I think we saw a presentation today that indicates that we're not only in, interested in meeting one of the standards, we're interested in meeting all of them. Student activities, the amount of activities and opportunities that we have, the first year experience, the courses, all of that play together. Undergraduate research. Um, then in this morning's meeting, we talked a little bit about the Markov chain and Trustee Golden mentioned that he had read the 2015 paper. What we don't talk about is that that was an honors thesis. That, that there's a 2015 paper from an honors thesis that talks about using a discrete time series Markov chain for university enrollment. We are not doing this for the sake of being able to talk in just meetings like this about it. We're doing it because everything we do provides an opportunity to advance the lives of somebody that wants to advance this region. We talk about capital projects in the buildings. You shouldn't Forgive me if I talk out of turn, but you shouldn't start in a building that has a certain quality at a two-year school and then transition to a lesser building at a four-year school. Focus on employee needs. If we take care of our staff, our staff will take care of our students, and everybody will be the better for it. And then the new budget model. And I do want to stress this because I presented the strategic plan to you before. The new budget model, before we had basically an annual budget. What is an annual budget? It's a one-year plan. The reason I'm excited about having a new budget model is for the first time when we talk about strategic planning, we can mean it because you can budget for more than one year. I mean, think about that. Think if you, all of you had to run your businesses where all you could do was budget on one year. I don't think we're going to get very far. I do want to give you some of the highlights that that disruption yielded. 164 uh, first-time freshmen, more than we had last year without sacrificing quality. Largest student FTE increase among Tennessee public universities. Record graduate enrollment. You've all heard the retention rate. But what we haven't talked about, but we will a little more as we start to dig into this because we're doing some studies later, and I'm sure that the president will talk about this. For a few years, we've been doing the Great Colleges to Workforce survey. And in the first year, it came out, and I always tell a little story about how the president goes, do you believe this? And I said, yeah, I believe it. And he says, I don't know. And then he goes to a meeting, he goes back, and he goes, yeah, you're right, I believe it. And so what I mean to say by that is the campus climate hasn't always been as good as it is today at ETSU. And what I think is important is this year on the great colleges to work for, we were only a few points off from the Carnegie class average. A few years ago, we had a double-digit gap to fill. So in four years, we have made significant progress on our enrollment, on the morale around campus, and on the impact that ETSU is having on the region. And I would like to think it's all because I started projecting enrollment with a Markov chain. <laughs> I do want to remind you one more time, this is what the projection looks like. And we'll follow up on this and start to break it down by credit hours using the induced course load matrix. Um, I also want to stress that when you see the number that we probably use for the budget, it will be a little less than this. Last year, we looked at um, an enrollment decrease of 184 students and the margin of error being down 350. And so we budgeted on, on a number in between the projected number and the bottom of the margin of error, which is always a good thing to do so that this year we can talk about how difficult it is to give out money instead of next year talking about trying to take it away. I thank you for your time, and I'll answer any questions. Anything from Mike? <laughs> uh, can I ask a quick question? 
and I, I know this is mathematics, but, but last year you projected a decline. The number rose higher than you anticipated. Yeah. This year, if I'm reading this right, you're projecting an increase. increase. Have any variables change? I mean, they obviously did. So. Well, so um, the usually one thing changes, and I can try to mitigate that impact on the model. Um, that didn't happen this time. Retention rate went up four points, and enrollment grew by double digits. I, those two things are both going to drive the model north. So what it expects, the model does in any annual increase, is that the number of new students you recruited, you're going to recruit about the same number of those. The percent of students that became freshmen, that became sophomores, that became juniors, about the same percent of that is going to happen. The problem is that that input number and that retention rate are the highest we've ever had. So we're talking about new territory for somebody who's trying to project. A few years ago when Promise happened, we mitigated the increase that we were seeing in the model because we knew Promise was coming. And so we just we took out 7% of the first-time full-time freshmen from Tennessee because we didn't expect they would be there. We were a little bit off on that. I think it was 116 we thought that we lost. But my point is we do try to adjust it when we can. But I just have to believe that what we've done is changed the paradigm and that the um, recruitment strategies and retention strategies that we have in place are going to continue to push those percentages higher, which is why the model's assuming that's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President. Chair, members of the board, good afternoon. I will do my best not to take the full allotted time to walk through my comments this afternoon. Uh, and for the first in a while, I'm not going to have a PowerPoint. Uh, I just would like to share some information with you around a series of thematic areas. Pause after each thematic area, see if you have questions, and, and hopefully have a little bit of a conversation. We've moved through a, a broad range of information in today's meeting. Uh, from conversations around enrollment projections and our ability to project enrollment to conversations around budgets to conversations around the success of student athletes. Uh, but I hope one thing that you'll see as a theme that emerges through this is we're trying to be very prescriptive in the way in which we approach the business operations of the institution. And we're doing our best to tie all of that to data into research. Um, if there is a, a, a variant in that projection and enrollment, um, that's important for us to try to capture it because we're building our budgets around what we anticipate enrollment will be. Uh, this fall, as Mike referenced and as the chair referenced, has been uh, an outstanding year in terms of enrollment, a year in which we surpassed expectations, a year in which we saw an increase of students of more than 2.6%. And you've already heard the information about the size of the freshman class. I like numbers, and I worked for a gentleman, Rich Rota, who really loved fun facts. So I want to share a couple fun facts with you that show the depth of the impact of the enrollment increase on the university. So in 2015, if you were to go into the cafeteria, on average, we served about 900 meals per day. This fall, we are serving 3,212 meals per day. 2,200 more meals per day are being served right down the hall. So when Dr. Hoff talked about culture change, things are changing. We're just having a hard time wrapping our arms around what those changes are and how you predict those changes moving forward. In 2015, there was one food truck delivery per week to the cafeteria. Now there are four. I have that as a little bit of a fun fact because it draws attention to the essence of things that are moving across campus. Residence halls are at capacity. 2,050 freshmen, 10% increase in the size of the freshman class. Our ability to continue this momentum uh, is really a function of staying focused on the plan, working that plan, and not stepping away from the gas pedal. Uh, one of my extreme concerns is that we've had an outstanding year and everyone's going to relax a little bit and say it's all going to be okay. But if you look around the horizon in the state of North Carolina, they are launching their version of Promise. 
There's a new president at an institution in Greenville who I'm good friends with, who is going to be aggressive in his approach. I also think he's going to be a wonderful partner to work with. But I know that other institutions across the state are looking at our playbook. So this is a year in which we have to gear up and push even harder so that we're positioned to come back before you next fall and share similar data around enrollment, enrollment projections, and the size of the freshman class. I want to thank the board for its approval of the scholarship pilot in Asheville and in Hendersonville. Um, as we look to things that are occurring in terms of growth markets, those are two growth markets that Dr. Hoff and Dr. Bach have identified, and that pilot will allow us to be aggressive in those two communities. Our actions are working. Uh, last Sunday in the Greensboro, North Carolina newspaper, there was a front page above the fold story on where students in North Carolina are going to college. And there was a little graphic of institutions. The institution at the top of that graphic was East Tennessee State University. So things are working when we're reading about our policy initiatives in the Greensboro, North Carolina newspaper. There's been a lot of conversation around enrollment, um, and I'd be happy to pause and see if you have any questions for me about enrollment, the Markov chain, or how we're approaching things for the fall. The next is student success. Um, as Dr. Hoff mentioned, our fall to fall retention rate this year is 75.9%. That's the highest in the history of the university. It's up 10 full percentage points over where that number found itself in 2012 and 2013. En enrollment, from my perspective, is more than the things that are happening with advising. They're more than the things that are happening in undergraduate research. It's more than what's happening in study abroad. Enrollment is a complete university initiative. Student success is a complete university initiative. Every person on this campus is involved in the enrollment initiative and the student success initiative. And I want to share a story with you from Open House last weekend. And it's a story that uh, it quite candidly happens with frequency. Um, but last weekend, I had a parent who was here from Memphis who had brought their daughter over to Door Campus. They'd never been to Johnson City before. And as I was walking this family across campus, I overheard the mom say to the dad, look at the grounds. If they take this good of care of the grass, they're going to take good care of our kid. That attention to detail in the grounds is part of a collective effort to focus on this institution and student success, and it's every single one of us. Dr. Hoff talked a little bit about culture. Um, that grounds crew, Sean Morris, Travis Watson, have been out and their staff have been out for more than a month and a half putting holiday lights all across campus. Now, at the end of September, when it was 90 degrees and you see folks stringing Christmas lights, it's a little disconcerting. But if you have the time available, I encourage you to join us this coming Monday at 630 when student body president Kiana Miller flips the switch, Santa Claus emerges, and for a little bit of time, on campus, we celebrate the spectacular beauty that comes with turning on holiday lights. Those little things create, create traditions and culture. They also create connections. That's an entire campus initiative involving the university school all the way up to the College of Medicine. Those little things create a culture of student success. So I can't point to any one thing and say that's the silver bullet for why our retention rate's up 10%. I can say everybody across campus from custodial services to grounds to advisors to faculty to staff to coaches in the athletic department, everyone is pushing as hard as they can to keep this momentum moving forward. But if you're looking for something to do next Monday at 6.30, um, we'll have hot chocolate, we'll have brownies, um, we'll have hopefully a healthy Santa Claus. I was Santa Claus three years ago. I'm a pretty anemic Santa Claus. Um, so we'll have a, a better person who? A member of the grounds crew because they've really wrapped their arms around this event. So I've tried to lighten student success a little bit by design, but I cannot highlight enough the significance of the attention, the science, the research, and the data that's gone into moving student success on campus. That 75.9% number has captured the attention of a lot of institutions across the state. I'd be happy to take any questions that you have on student success. All right, next relates to the merger. Um, since we were last together, there has been a significant amount of energy 
uh, exerted by individuals in this room related to the merger. Um, would like to thank the chair, would like to thank Linda Latimer, would like to thank David Golden for your work in supporting myself, Dr. Bishop, and others as we've worked with staff at Mountain States in Wilmot to help keep this moving along. Um, you affirmed the MOU today for, for Wilmot, and I'm confident that by the time we're meeting this point in time next year, that we're talking about a merge system and what that means. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I thank you for charging me to bring back to the board at the next meeting recommendations around changes to our research corporation, changes to our research foundation and its activity with respect to nature, staffing, structure, and organization. Um, the chance to realize investments from the merger have the opportunity to change the face of this institution. We have some work to do internally to ensure that our structures are ready to onboard those investments. Uh, we also need to look down the field at opportunities to grow residencies, to grow uh, research opportunities, and to bring faculty and staff to the campus to meet your expectations and to meet the expectations of the healthcare system. Um, and I look forward to presenting uh, that information to you at our next meeting. Um, with respect to budgeting, um, you've heard a lot of uh, comment today around budgets, and budgets on a college campus are confusing. Uh, there are very few places that you're going to ever have the opportunity to be involved with where you approve a budget in July, they come back to you in October and want to change all the numbers, then they come back to you in the spring, want to change the numbers again, and then at the end of the year the budgets are finalized. But part of that is just a function of the way the systems are organized. We build that budget in July based upon what we anticipate enrollment will be, and then in October we bring a budget back to you that includes carry forward funding as well as revenue generated from enrollment growth. This year is a unique year for us. Um, in conversations with Dr. Stanton, he has shared with me, Brian, I never remember a year when I was president when we had discretionary revenue that wasn't budgeted. I remember conversations with Governor Ramsey when we were going into legislative sessions in which there was money available. And you would always say, Brian, the worst session of them all is a session when there's money to spend. The easiest session are sessions when you're making cuts. So this has been an interesting fall on campus as the university community realizes their money, money's available to be invested. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about how to best invest those resources. As Dr. King shared with the Finance Committee this morning, we're going to put a portion of this new revenue into reserves because it's incumbent upon the institution to rebuild its reserves. Sooner or later, it will rain. Sooner or later, there will be another downturn in state revenues, and we must build our reserves now for that inevitable rainy day. All in all, we've got somewhere around $7 million in reserves. Uh, the industry standard rule of thumb is 10% of your unrestricted ENG operating. Our ENG operating, if you remember the chart, is right around $250 million, which would be $25 million in reserves. We've booked money to go into reserves for this fall, and then we've incorporated into our budgets moving forward an annual million dollar, million dollar, million dollar payments into reserves. So we recognize the need to build reserves, but we also recognize the need to reward those departments who have grown. For the several decades on campus, the amount of money I had this year is equal to the amount of money that I had last year. If I grew, my revenue stayed the same. If I declined, my revenue stayed the same. So moving to a decentralized model, which we will implement this fall, we will send revenues back to those units that experienced enrollment growth but we're also going to retain some revenue at the university level to support things that come as a result of changing landscapes around us. Uh, we need to invest in campus security. Um, all of us are paying attention to the things that are happening across the country. Um, the locks on these doors cannot be locked from the inside. And Jeremy Ross and his team have done a complete inventory of classrooms across campus and will begin to, stall, to install uh, locks that allow you to lock classrooms from the inside, something you cannot do now, uh, but you'll see us invest in security. You'll see us invest in a couple of positions that allow us to continue to push on enrollment, but the bulk of the resources, 70% of the new revenue from enrollment growth, we're going to send back to the colleges to reward them for their efforts to make that enrollment growth possible after we've invested in reserves. Um, so as you look at what is the next step in the process, I want to thank Dr. Larry Calhoun and James Batchelder, who are here with us today, who helped to build 
the model and the process, and they're now working across the campus uh, to educate individuals on what it's like to have the opportunity to manage your own resources and to carry some of those resources forward from year to year. I just went through a great deal on budgets in a short manner. Let me pause and see if you have any questions for me about, about, about budgets. Could you remind the board what um, percentage of our total budget is actually funded by the state? Uh, Mr. Chair, of the $250 million that's unrestricted for the operations of the campus, uh, less than 25 cents on the dollar comes from the state of Tennessee. So the bulk of the resources that make this university run are tuition fees, grants, contracts, and externally sponsored research. That's why it's so important that we model enrollment. Uh, when Dr. Hoff made his comment about private institutions, I've been pushing us to begin to structure this institution from a budget perspective as if we were a private university because that's the direction that we're headed. Um, if we have the best year ever from Nashville, uh, that probably equates to about a 250 or 300 student enrollment growth. Um, so it's just a, a direction that we're headed, but 25 cents on the dollar comes from the state. Other questions on budgets? Um, next would be facilities. Um, much of what I had prepared in terms of my update on facilities has already been covered. Uh, but what I do want to mention two items that are significant. Uh, when the Tennessee Higher Education Commission meets this coming Wednesday, um, they will affirm uh, a process that both Dr. King and Jeremy Ross and their staff have been working on for months, and that's a process of severance. We will be the first institution that was aligned with the Board of Regents to be approved in the capital severance process, which means we have the ability for the first time in the history of the institution to manage our own capital projects. There were other institutions that began the journey down the road with us, but we were the only institution that the state will approve at this point in time. So that will allow us to select architects, to, to select construction designers, to select project managers. Um, one of the reasons why we've held on Lamb Hall uh, is to provide that opportunity for the severance process to be complete. So then as we begin the designer selection for Lamb Hall, that is a designer selection that we're managing locally rather than it being managed at the Board of Regents. And then likewise for procurement, um, we will be the first institution to go through the procurement severance. Um, Jeremy and his staff and BJ and her staff have been back and forth to Nashville every other week going through training. Uh, there's a lot of work that's gone into the preparation for this. Uh, but want to take a moment to thank the two of them and all of their teams for the work that they've done to position us uh, to be the first institution to be officially severed. And that's their language, not ours, uh, but severed as it relates to capital as well as procurement. Um, I do want to just tamper everyone's expectations a little bit on capital. Um, I had a, a little bit of fun with Jeremy while he was out of the room. Um, but if this project makes the top 10 list, which I feel very confident that it will, um, that doesn't mean that it will open tomorrow. Um, it will take several years for that project to come to fruition. But if you were to close your eyes and dream of ETSU in 2023, in 2023, this building will be completely renovated. We will have opened the Martin Center. We will have opened a new humanities building. We will have renovated Roger Stout. We will have renovated Matheson. We will, Math Mathis, we will have put an addition onto Lamb Hall, and we would have begun work on a new parking garage. That's a lot of activity in a six year time period and that's what we're set up for. Um, not only are we set up for that, almost every single thing that I just mentioned to you already has funding in place. The one that we did not anticipate, but if it arrives, it changes the face of undergraduate education on this campus, which is the humanities building. We've never had a $74 million project. We've had $20 million projects and $12 million projects. A $74 million project is a game changer for our institution. Um, would be happy to address any questions you may have for me on facilities. It's late in the afternoon. I will move with speed through the remaining items. Um, next relates to athletics. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, look forward to working with Scott Carter and staff across campus as we bring to you uh, that Title IX plan. Um, it's critical for the institution to begin that planning process to ensure that we remain compliant with the responsibilities and regulations entailed within Title IX. I do not know what the new sports will be, uh, but that will emerge through the conversations over the course of the next year. I do know that for the sports that we have at the institution, this is an outstanding fall. 
Senior day for volleyball is this Saturday. Uh, they're positioned to win the conference championship and then move on to the NCAA tournament. Um, soccer is moving into uh, the conference uh, tournament on the men's side, and hopefully Coach Ashani puts us once again back into the NCAA tournament. For fall sports, women's basketball begins tonight. Uh, so we take on the University of Cincinnati tonight, 7 o'clock in Brooks Gym. Uh, for those of you who are looking for something to do on a Friday evening, uh, for those of you who have the ability to, to teletransport, um, I look forward to watching you on television in Cincinnati as the men's team takes on Northern Kentucky this evening. Uh, this time next week, uh, we'll be preparing to take on the University of Kentucky in Lexington as the men play UK um, up in Rupp Arena. Um, I want to thank many of you in this room for making some things that occurred this fall possible. Um, shared with Dr. Latimer, a copy of the alumni magazine, um, it was a wonderful fall on campus in Green Stadium, and as the alumni magazine arrives in your mailboxes over the course of the next few days, you'll see pictures from uh, the opening of that stadium. Uh, but thanks to you for uh, what you've done this fall, and Lieutenant Governor Ramsey, thanks to you for what you've done as well to make that stadium a dream, a reality. It's hard to believe that the season's almost over with, but it sure was rewarding to open the season and to close the season with a win. But the most important wins athletically are the ones that Mr. Carter outlined in terms of the academic performance of our student athletes. 40 student athletes with a perfect 4.0 GPA and the number of student athletes on the Dean's list were beyond description. So things are moving well in that area and we'll ensure that they continue to move well as we present updated Title IX plans to you in the next year. Um, Bridget gave an update on legislative issues. Um, we're gonna blink and the legislative session is upon us. Um, I do anticipate that we will see a lot of conversation uh, in the General Assembly about issues related to campus safety and look forward to briefing you at the next meeting of the Board of Trustees on what legislation has made its way into the hopper. Uh, this has been, I think, a really unique time across American higher education this fall as we're seeing elements that are happening in the larger society playing their way out on our campuses. Um, we have had two major incidences that have really given me concern this fall, both of which involve campus safety. Uh, last week, the leadership of the institution was in Abington having a senior leadership retreat where we were theoretically going to spend our time on long-range planning. But at about 7.30 in the morning, Jeremy Ross received a call from the chief of police that there had been a threat of a shooting at the university school. And immediately, a small team of us huddled in the conference room and started to debrief on that threat, uh, move through a series of actions in which a student was detained, questioned, parents were detained, questioned, that then spread to another school in Johnson City. And for the better part of four hours, we ran through a real life drill of the potential of an active shooter in the university school. Two weeks prior, we ran through a real life drill in which there had been a threat of an active shooting at a homecoming event in the dome. And in the course of 15 minutes, had to evacuate 1,800 people from the dome because there was a threat of a shooter. Um, never would I have envisioned we would have that happen twice, but that's the world that we find ourselves in. So I've directed Jeremy Ross to conduct a top to bottom review of threat assessment and safety on campus, and we'll also bring that to you within the next year. There's not any one button that we can push to make everyone on campus feel safe. I wish there was, but there's not. Locks aren't going to do it. More cameras aren't going to do it. It's just the world that we live in, but I wanted to share with you how seriously we take this as members of your administrative team. Um, we have made mistakes in each of those two incidents but thankfully we've had the opportunity to learn from them um, and we'll put process improvements in place to ensure that God forbid that there ever was something on our campus that we're as prepared as we can possibly be. Let me pause to see if you have any questions for me as it relates to those matters um, before uh, discussing the final item. I have one comment. I think I would speak on behalf here of the entire board. Do not wait on us on any issue involving safety. When you see it, fix it. Sure, we'll do. To, to the best of our ability, we'll do. 
Um, if, if we could find a way to put cameras everywhere, we would. Um, and that may be ultimately where we're heading. Uh, Dr. Linville shared with me a story from the Memphis Commercial Appeal uh, that UT Health Sciences Center in Memphis is undergoing a $20 million safety upgrade for the campus. And they have the ability to hand off from camera to camera to camera all across campus um, if something's happening. Um, I know a lot of this ekes of George Orwell, um, but that is where a lot of institutions are going from a safety perspective. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the last thing that I, I want to do is talk a little bit about the operations of the board. Um, I want to thank you for your willingness to be flexible as it relates to the calendar for today. I know that was a last minute change, um, but I hope that you uh, enjoyed the opportunity to participate in the Veterans Day celebration, which brought together both the university school as well as the institution as a whole and our community members. We've talked at length about a retreat. And I'm going to send you some information next week around retreat options, retreat dates. Do we do it here? Do we do it off-site? We've also talked a lot with you about the opportunity for um, a deep dive into aspects of the campus. And I'm going to send you topics with the goal of launching that activity in January. Um, I joked to the governor in the budget hearing on Tuesday that all of the institutions are still trying to get a sense of what it means to have a board. And you as board members are still trying to get a sense of what it means to be a board. Um, but to be at the point in time where we are for meeting number four, I feel very good about the operations of the board, but would really welcome your comments, your ideas, your suggestions, because I know we have a lot of room for growth and a lot of room for improvement as a staff. So when I send you this email next week that outlines topics, that outlines dates, that outlines themes, uh, that is a proposal that's not a final point and would welcome your comment and feedback on how you would like to see the professional development of the board in 2018 structured and engaged. Um, Mr. Chair, but before wrapping up, um, I, I want to share one little story with you. I promise I'll keep it brief. It's 3 o'clock, and I hope uh, an individual who is a member of the Board of Trustees uh, doesn't take offense with the story that I'm about to tell. Um, but it's a story that really um, conveys the, the power of this institution. About a month ago, right around homecoming, I had the honor to be a part of something that was truly special, an opportunity for the university as a whole to say thank you to an individual who has transformed the lives of thousands of students at this institution. And there were about a thousand people gathered in Muncie Church downtown to be part of a birthday party, to be part of a birthday celebration. But really, it wasn't a celebration as much of a birthday as it was a celebration of the mission of this institution. For about 45 minutes, a group of undergraduate students in the corral, men's and women's chorus, all sang. And at the conclusion of their performance, Dr. Matthew Potterton, head of the chorus program, chair of the music department, asked how many of those students who had just finished their performance had received Powell scholarships. Every single one of them raised their hand. They then processed to the back of the room. They were then replaced by an alumni choir, individuals who had been part of the music department at East Tennessee State University from the mid-1970s all the way through 2012. They were directed by Dr. Tom Genrett, the long-standing director of the course at our university. And as Dr. Genrett took the podium to lead his alum and song, people began to cry. And for the next hour, it was among the most moving things I've ever been a part of. About halfway through the performance, Dr. Genrette asked, how many of you have received scholarships from the PALS that made your education possible? 75% of them raised their hand and people continued to cry. And then it got moving. In 2012, which was Dr. Genrette's last year, there was a group called the Bucksworth. And for those of you who are familiar with the Bucksworth, there's been the 10 Bucksworth, the 8 Bucksworth, but in 12, it was his last year, there was the 12 Bucksworth. There was a young man in the 12 Bucksworth who about a year and a half ago had suffered an aneurysm, almost passed away, and has really worked hard to bring himself back into the position that he's in. He stood and sang with the other 12 members of the Bucksworth that night. And it was among the most moving things that I've ever had a chance to see. 
But what was powerful about this is that Dr. Tom Jenrette, for two weeks prior to that concert, went over to this young man's house and practiced with him to get him ready for that night. I talk all the time about the mission of this university is to improve the quality of life for the people of this region. But to see teaching, research, and service come together that night, people saying thank you to an individual, but really remembering what it was like to be 18 years old again and to say thank you to a faculty member, to be 50 years old and still feel the connection with the faculty member that I saw that night between the alum and Dr. John Jenrette is something that happens at few institutions. I had the chance to sit next to Dr. DPH or the president of the University of Tennessee that night. I guarantee you that doesn't happen on his campus. It happens here. And it happens here because of the generosity of individuals in this room. It happens here because of the faculty who are committed to the mission. And when Dr. Hoff talked about culture changing, I hope we don't lose that culture. We may change, we may grow, we may get bigger, we become more complex and count things differently. But I hope we don't lose who we are, which is an institution that's focused on people. So Mr. Powell, I know you don't like attention to be drawn to you, but that night was among the most powerful things I've ever had a chance to be a part of. And on behalf of the entire faculty and staff of this institution, I wanted to say thank you for allowing me and my family to be a part of it. Mr. Chair, that concludes my comments. We'd be happy to take any questions. I don't want to leave it there. Uh, how about a round of applause? For <laughs> Mr. Chair, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Well, we're almost at the end. Uh, <laughs> other business, uh, Fred, I believe we were talking about something I'd like for you to go ahead and comment about. Thank you. I, I had uh, made a request just before this meeting started to make a request to the university, and it's been highlighted by some of what I've heard here, uh, some of it involving Jeremy Ross and his ability to make persuasive uh, movements toward capital projects, particularly with his camera and his organization, but also something that Mike Hoff said about capital projects that um, we don't want folks coming from two-year institutions to our institution to find that uh, they had better facilities at their two-year institutions than they had here. Uh, I will I'll raise a case, a point. Uh, I'd like a university, I will request the university make a comparative review with the goal of updating and modernizing our STEM labs, our math labs, our biology labs, our chemistry labs, our physics labs, and nursing labs as well. Uh, to look at the physical aspects of some of those in the surrounding communities and their technologies, uh, the materials and supplies that they have to provide to incoming students. Uh, notably, I think uh, if we make uh, a pilgrimage to Walther State and to Northeast State and compare those laboratories to what we may have in Brown Hall and some of the other buildings, uh, I think it uh, will be instructive. I also think if we look at some of the high schools around, it will be instructive. Uh, our ability to recruit good students in, in STEM, and we have some good students, but to recruit more, to engage in undergraduate research, which is exceedingly important in the department that I'm in, but other STEM uh, areas as well. Uh, I think all of these kinds of things are something that we should look at and see if we're where we need to be. Um, the Brown Hall that I work out of uh, was added to significantly in the 1960s. Uh, the laboratories in the freshman side of biological sciences haven't changed since I got here in 72. Uh, take a look at what we are offering, but also take a look at what we could offer. And so this, I am making a request that we, we review those on a comparative basis. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other business to come before the board? That I'll ask for a motion of adjournment. So, so I'm I'm all in favor. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. There's a board Thank you. A calendar adjustment. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are interested in bringing grandchildren to the holiday lighting ceremony, it's 5.45, not 6.30. Oh. Um, I gave the wrong time. So if you were putting that on your calendar, it's 5.45, not 6.30.
Well, I'm showing my mind.